The New Babylon, Chapter 5 Winston Carver lived in the neighborhood with his brother Clive. The two had come to this country and this section of Queens over 20 years ago from Kingston, Jamaica, to live with their grandmother, Maylene. Before they came to this country, they lived with their mom in a run-down tenement in a rough section of Kingston. One evening, while waiting in line to check out at the market, they helplessly watched as their mom was shot to death during a robbery there. Maylene lived in the neighborhood for over 40 years and attended Harvest Fields Baptist Church for almost that entire time. When her only daughter was murdered in Jamaica, she gladly accepted responsibility for the two boys. She lived a simple life, a humble existence of meager means. She raised her grandsons to be good men. Sometimes that meant she couldn't afford to spare the rod of correction which she yielded readily, but justly. When circumstances forced her to do so, she took no pleasure in it. When she told the boys, this is going to hurt me more than it will hurt you, she meant it. Still, she did so because she knew the value of honest discipline. She knew that the process of turning boys into men was not always an easy one. Clive was two years older than Winston. Growing up in the city was not easy for the boys. They watched every day as good, honest men struggled to make a living and support their families. They watched as another sort of man drove fancy cars and lived lives of leisure, spending most of their days at home relaxing and most of their nights hanging around the various neighborhood bars and social clubs. Maylene always warned her boys not to be like those men. She would say, When you boys grow up, you stay away from those places. You be like so-and-so and and go out and get yourself an honest job. The boys always nodded and agreed with her. They knew better than to challenge Maylene when she was making a point. But deep down, they questioned her direction. They wondered why they should go work hard all day and have nothing at the end of the week when the men who seemingly lived the life of leisure always had money. They always drove nice cars and kept company with pretty women. They always seemed happy and jovial. Winston and Clive talked about these things when they were lying in their beds alone on the hot summer nights, struggling to find the sleep which eluded them. They would just lay there and talk for hours, listening to the sounds of the city that never slept, just outside their window. In their childhood minds, they saw those men of leisure living the good life. They saw men who had the respect of everyone in the neighborhood. Even the gang members that ran the streets in the nearby neighborhoods steered clear of these men. But what they did not know was that these men were bullies. People did not respect them. They feared them. These two things were not the same. It would, however, be years before the brothers would know the difference. To them, these men had everything. Everything that the brothers wanted. The working men started early and went late. They barely made enough to make ends meet. At the end of the day, they got off the bus, tired and weary. Then they would see men like Tony Da Silva driving around in his big Cadillac, seemingly without a care in the world. He would park right outside the Sons of Italy social club at the curb in front. He would leave his car there for hours, often until the wee hours of the morning. It always amazed the boys how Tony could walk away from his car, leaving the windows wide open and the keys in the ignition. Nobody ever bothered the car. Other unsuspecting citizens would park on the street to go into a store. They would come out after 20 minutes and the car would be gone or broken into and robbed of everything inside of any value. But Tony Da Silva's caddy would always remain untouched, unmolested in any way. 
Tony was a larger-than-life character. His broad smile revealed a gold tooth, which matched the jewelry he wore on his fingers and wrists. Gold rings, gold watch, and gold bracelets. Tony always was impeccably dressed, and always adorned with gold accessories. People were always polite and gracious when they encountered him in the street. His closest friends, those belonging to his inner circle, called him Sylvie. Other associates called him Tony. Everybody else referred to him as Mr. De Silva. Tony often held court in the street. He sat at a table outside the club and drank coffee during the day. He always had two or three large men around him, associates who seemed to just be hanging around, but clearly had a bigger purpose when people approached Tony. They would intercept anyone trying to get an audience with him. Some were allowed through, others turned away. Yes, to the brothers, Tony De Silva was a man who commanded respect, a man who had everything. Now, in the days and months after the collapse, Tony wasn't seen much in the neighborhood. He still lived there. He had an old warehouse that he converted long ago. On the ground floor was a large garage which held his now useless fleet of antique and collectible cars. On the second floor was one of his many enterprises, a now closed down gambling parlor. On the third and top floor was his apartment. It was 3,000 feet of lavish opulence, a tribute to the man he was before the collapse. Now, when the banking system first failed, Tony flourished. He had large reserves of cash and the collapse seemed initially to impact him very little. However, it wasn't long until money had no value. Once the food supplies and gas pumps dried up, one had very little need for money. Because he had cash reserves, Tony was able to maintain a first world lifestyle for longer than most. He saw the inevitable coming. He was able to use his criminal contacts and enterprises to locate and purchase large food stores. He had them trucked early enough to his building and now, months later, was still living off of that storage. His building was a fortress. Most of his associates left the neighborhood after the collapse, but a few of Tony's closest friends remained loyal and stayed with him to survive and protect what they had together. Tony's mother was a congregant of Harvest Fields Baptist Church her whole life. She was there when Isaac Rubens took over as pastor. She had Pastor Rubens over to her home every third Sunday after service for a big Italian home-cooked meal. Many of the people who attended the church invited Isaac Rubens to their home often for a meal, and while he could never admit it to anyone else in the church, Concetta da Silva's home was his favorite place in the world to go eat Sunday dinner. Most Sundays, Tony was also in attendance there. Each man aboard what the other did for a living, but both had a mutual respect for the other because of who that person was to Concetta da Silva. Isaac Rubens was forced to see firsthand the lives that Tony da Silva ruined in the neighborhood, and the only real limitations that Tony had were those that his mother imposed upon him. And her relationship with Pastor Rubens limited him often and in a way that impacted him significantly. That all ended the day Isaac Rubens led the celebration of life and homegoing of Concetta da Silva after she passed away quietly in her sleep one autumn evening just prior to the collapse. Now when Isaac Rubens left the infirmary in his home after talking with Olivia on the night her husband was shot, He walked down the street toward the church. As he did, he looked up to see Tony Da Silva looking out his apartment window at him. 
Isaac gave an awkward smile and waved to him. Tony smiled menacingly, revealing his gold tooth, which seemed to glimmer in the dim light of the moon. He held up his index finger and pointed it as I, at Isaac like it was a gun. He made a motion with his thumb as if it were the hammer of the gun dropping as he winked at Pastor Rubens. John Allen stood on the top of the steps outside the massive oak door to the church. He waited for Isaac as he turned and walked up the steps. John was unaware of Tony watching them from his window. <laughs>